Could you ever be in my shoes? If you think so, I think you're a fool. I am me. Only I understand me. This isn't anything against you. I just want you to see. To you, I might be your normal girl, but I'll tell you, I have an extremely complicated world. When I was little, I was kind of strange. Constantly being watched, I knew I wasn't the same. All my life, at first, it was a world full of no. I got B's and C's, shows what they know. So I dare you to live in my shoes. Well, I have autism. Want to think twice before you choose? My name is Georgina Louise Ward, but everybody calls me Georgie. I am like any other 20-year-old woman. I am finishing my final year at university. I enjoy going out to gigs and hanging out with my friends. But there is something about me that is not obvious to the human eye. I am actually a proud sufferer of high-functioning autism. I guess I've always known that I was sort of different from everybody else because I always had someone in school, I mean, sort of sat with me kind of watching what I was doing, keeping my behaviour in check but obviously I never really knew what it was till I think I was about eight years old and that was actually the first time I actually had any prejudice against me because I had this teacher um, he basically would always send me out of the classroom because he was afraid of what I would do and my behaviour so just I would be completely removed from everybody else and it would just be me outside the classroom on my own, me and my helper and that was when I really kind of questioned like what, what was wrong with me because I thought because I thought at first it was because I was being naughty but I wasn't really doing anything wrong so I approached my both my parents about it and then they actually told me I was actually very very angry at the time when I found out because I just didn't really understand it and I just thought why is this happening to me, I don't understand, this isn't fair, <laughs> you know, all those kind of thoughts and then I just kind of grew to accept it eventually and try and make it into a positive which is kind of what I aim to do every day of my life because I'm sick and tired of hearing people complain and sort of highlight kind of the bad because don't get me wrong it's a terrible thing and it can be hard to cope with but there are positives to having autism and no ways to get through it. I really want to show that to people and I want to meet other people that are in sort of the same position as me where they're doing well in life, they, they're kind of coping and I, that's all I really want to do. I've known about my autism since I was quite young but of course I don't quite remember my youth antics so I go down memory lane and invite my parents, Pat and John, to tell me their experience of raising an autistic child. I suppose it was when he was about 18 months old-ish. Every, every parent does it, compares the first child with the second child. And Darren started talking early. We knew that because he was yakking away before he was a year old, wasn't he? Yes. But we, we noticed you, you weren't talking a lot. You, you just, were. Just say the odd word. Yeah, and then, um, and we just didn't think any more of it, but then nothing, and, you go to the health visitor and the doctor surgery and they say, oh no, she's probably going to be developing late and all this sort of thing. So I carried on and carried on and still nothing. And we took you to a speech therapist and still you, we couldn't get you to talk. But then one day I'd... Never do this with your own child. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd just put you in the bath and you used to watch Pinocchio, oh, Walt Disney's Pinocchio. And I sat you in the bath left you in there just to nip to the linen cupboard to get some towels. And all of a sudden I could hear you talking and saying the words of the film perfectly. You were doing all the characters. You were doing the characters. You were, you were, you, you were, uh, your accents were right. The noises you were making sort of tied up with the characters. And I thought, hey, you know, I thought, hang on a minute, something wrong here. And as soon as I walked back in the bathroom, you stopped. And I thought, and I said, Georgie, come on. Carry on, it was really good. But nah, just, you just blanked me. I just didn't do it. <laughs> Blank. And then I knew that something wasn't right. Autism is on a continuum. If you're low in the continuum, you're very severely affected. But you are high on the continuum. And your basic problems are 
in then was your social interaction with your peers. Yeah. I've always thought of your development as like a set of traffic lights, um, right. red, amber and green with, with, with say normal children goes from when you're newborn it's red and then it turns to amber and then it goes to green and then you're off and running and you develop naturally you all seem to get stuck at amber <laughs> you never quite got over <laughs> until you had to learn to get over it and then it went green for you but you had to learn things how to interact with other people yourself you you had to learn that it wasn't something that came naturally to you you didn't yeah. if i spoke to you if you didn't think I warranted an answer. You wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. No, you wouldn't talk to me. Well, your mm. first day at uni, I was quite gobsmacked. You walked into the apartment, didn't you? And 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 you just said, "Hello, hi, my name's George." And I'm thinking, <laughs> what? But yes, but it's been a, It was a struggle in the early years. Yeah. With you and and getting the help that I we knew you needed. It's he who shouts loudest gets the most help, and that's why you got help because we just would not give in. So, I mean, we told the, the chap from the council who was in charge of your case that when they said there's no money, I told him, I said, I don't care if you've only got £10 left, I want it spent on her. And that's what you have to do. You have to keep on and, and on. on and on until you get what you want. Talking to my parents has certainly given me a deeper look on how I was as a child. But I'm curious to meet other people who were in a similar situation to myself. So through Autism West Midlands, I was able to meet Nicholas, who agreed to meet up for a chat about his experience with his disability. We're here today to discuss something that we do have in common, high-functioning autism. And I want to know, sort of, what is your story sort of behind you finding out about your disability and how did you cope with it? Well, I didn't really find it out myself. Yeah. Uh, well, so, to cut a long uh, story short, is I, I was a normal uh, baby and then then I just stopped talking altogether up to the age of eight and then after that um, I just started going back to what when I was slightly smaller and then diagnosis side of things I didn't get diagnosed until probably roughly the age of the 11 ish when I was still at primary school so um, after that I thought if you've got it, you've got it. So. And so, how did that really make you feel at the time? Were you angry, relieved? Like, what was going through your head? I thought, oh, that's new. <laughs> that's new. So, to me, that it didn't really actually, really bother me that much. So, I just, I thought, oh, there's a bit of a challenge out there. So, I thought, oh, I'll just. Um, if Which you, is, that's quite unique because obviously people who do who are known to have autism don't really like sort of change in a sense. But you no. sort of took for, okay, I've got it. Nothing I can do, bring it on. It's yeah, it's the people who don't understand it who are pretty negative against people like us. I managed to grab a chat with Nick's mother, Barbara, to give her version of events. When he was first born, he, we thought, he, well, we knew there was, there'd been a problem when he was born because his scores were very low and I wasn't allowed to have him for two days. He's been in special care, so we knew there was something, but we didn't think it was anything permanent. And then he started talking very early, about five months, he was saying things. We thought, oh great, like his brother, another chatterbox. And, um, and then at nine months, he just stopped vocalising altogether. And we thought, it's a bit strange. And then they were saying, they started to say, well, oh, he has some problems with his hips and he had to have those, he had to have an anaesthetic and things like that. And he had to have his legs in splints and things. And that sort of focused our mind away from the fact that he wasn't talking. And he understood everything we said. And he used to take us by the hand when he wanted things. And we thought, well, you know, he wants to communicate, but he just doesn't know but how. But he doesn't know how. And we knew there was something wrong. And I think that should have alerted them. But of course, autism wasn't known so much in those days. And he went to speech therapy. And I said, tell me, what do you think this is? Because I, by then, was doing some health, a health visiting course at the college and we had to do a project and we had to pick some sort of disability right. and uh, one of them was autism a lot of 
the others had got and it was left and I said well let's try this it sounds like this might be interesting so I went off to the library and got all books well, there was only two books on the subject only two books, only two books on the subject this was and in, what and one this was this? early 70s early, early 70s. 70s and I said to the uh, speech therapist do you think he might be autistic oh no she said he's got a, de a developmental dysphasia and I mean that's the same thing, you yeah. know. Um, anyway, I so I just took no notice of that. But anyway, he did help. The speech therapy did help him, and it actually m taught him how to make sentences, how to ask questions which he didn't know how to do. Obviously, you had get support from Autism West Midlands. Um, what kind of support do they sort of put in place for you? I, I understand that you do a lot of group sessions with um, Aspire. Yeah. Like, tell us a little more about that. I, I heard about it from. The, the local DEA um, to say, oh, there's this place in Digba saying this is spy, do you want to go along? And so I um, signed up and said, went on a uh, kind of a course, but it was um, just to, to say, help you in back into the job market. So. Yeah. Uh, and, you, and I understand that you do sort of fundraisers. Like, what exactly do you do to sort of help them? Um, it's the top of the fundraising I do, I actually go to these particular, um, to Wales, um, Shropshire, Staffordshire, and do uh, mountain biking, which is, to a point, you throw yourself off the, off the side of a hill. I did, uh, I think, five or six races, and I raised um, £165 for them. That's amazing. It's great to see that Nick is so passionate about mountain biking, but my hobbies are somewhat more indoorsy. Music is probably a big thing that kind of helps me cope a bit more. I tend to feel more myself if, if I've got headphones in or I'm listening from my laptop. But yeah, I'm more comfortable with my music, playing with my Xbox, writing and, and reading mostly. That's, that's my life. Today I'm here at the Serious Games Institute to check out a new game that is currently in development for iSpectrum, which is helping people on the high functioning autism level, helping them with their communication skills with employment and job interviews. How did iSpectrum sort of begin? Like, what was its sort of basis and how it all started? First of all, that uh, a lot of people um, on the autistic spectrum were having difficulty getting into employment. And um, working in serious games, we also recognised that there was no sort of uh, new technology that was trying to address that. So we brought those two things together and um, we decided, well, there's an opportunity here to make a game that would engage people on the spectrum and also provide them with some um, training and skills towards getting themselves into employment. So explain how the game works sort of step by step, like what are the levels that are included within the game? The first level is just to choose your character or your avatar as we call it and then you go to a short interview um, where you speak to an employment advisor and you, they give you some uh, basic uh, job skills. Following that you can choose from three different work environments. It's the first scene in the game where you have to select your avatar and so you can choose any one of these characters, just click on them. And here I was thinking it was going to be a blue person. And then you go into your first interview. She's just basically greeting me. She looks like she means business though. So basically the first stage is kind of like a practice run. Yeah. So this is essentially like the job centre. Yeah, it's kind of like a job centre, someone who's advising you on some of the skills that you'd need when you go through the interview for real. If your interviewer is talking a lot, you should, should you interrupt them with your opinions? Because uh, obviously you don't want to seem rude when you do it. Uh, I'm going to say no, you should wait till they finish talking and that's the right answer apparently. Go me. Okay, she's, list she's listing three possible jobs for me. And so you just choose which one you want. Yeah. I've got option of working in an office, working in a supermarket or working in a garden. I'm going to say an office. So, do you think you've picked up any useful tips from playing the game? I mean, obviously, it's just the, the introduction thing, and it's sort of like, but honestly, yeah, I have actually. I think the clothes one I would never have considered. So, yeah, I think I have picked something up uh, from playing, just playing the intro part of it all. Um, and I think it's also good for people, obviously, who are just a little lower on the, um, on the Asperger's spectrum, whatever they call it. I mean, it could definitely help people with their communication skills. And, yeah, I liked it. I think it's a good product. Thank you. Cool. Overall, I found it 
the experience quite amazing actually because um, obviously this is the first time that anything like this has been made to help people who are on the uh, high autistic spectrum. I definitely would recommend this for people with autism. Ice Spectrum is a two year project and it will run until September 2012. Even though I have high functioning autism I still sort of struggle occasionally with certain things. For example, my organisational skills are shocking. Sometimes it's hard for me to kind of engage in actually in to start. So, so for example, um, my dissertation that I'm currently doing right now, t it took me a good three weeks to properly start it and start the analysing because, I don't know, it's like at first I thought it's because I was afraid of it. <laughs> because it's such a lot of work and everything like that, but I think it's because I wasn't very confident in myself and that's usually a lot of something I struggle with is having the confidence to go ahead and start something. To help me cope with the amount of university work I have to do, I go to regular mentor sessions with Hilary Finnis, who has been helping me since 2009. Well she wasn't difficult to cope with in the um, first year, although there were occasions when I think because of the workload and the um, you know the fact that she was in a university and away from familiar surroundings it, it was difficult for her and when a deadline was coming and um, she had some work to do wasn't quite sure what she had to do then I think I could sense that she was getting stressed and worried so we would talk about that and I definitely have seen um, Georgie mature over the three years she's much more able to cope with demands now than, than in the first and second year but she's very punctual she knows what she's got to do if she doesn't know what she's got to do she'll go and ask she does get worried about things and still stressed but I can see that she's managing that much better and is, is generally much more confident about what she's doing. There are others like Hilary who are trying to help people cope better with their disability so when I heard about John Simpson's work and how he was diagnosed with autism after being submitted to a psychiatric unit, I just had to meet him. Obviously, we both have something in common, we're both autistic. I think yours is a slightly different level to what mine is. Yeah. What has been your experience like when you learnt about the autism and how, how, how did you learn about it? Well, I actually discovered that I was autistic, or I was told that I was autistic at the age of 16 when I ended up being admitted to a residential psychiatric unit. That's pretty late. Uh, it is, well, it is, but what you'll tend to find is uh, that people come in two sort of groups. You'll get the people that are sort of, when they get to three or four, their behaviour is so outrageous, it's so challenging, it's so obvious that there's something different that they'll immediately be referred to an educational psychologist and then to a diagnostician. But then what you'll also get is people like me who get through to the age of 16 because they can just about cope at school. Were you, were you angry about it? Were you sort of relieved? What was your feeling about it when you found out? First couple of years, if I'm brutally honest, I rejected it. I didn't want to know. Um, yeah. Even though it was an answer, it wasn't the answer that I wanted. So I wasn't interested. And even though obviously I was still having profound effects of autism, even after I was discharged from the psychiatric unit, um, I still really struggled, I was still not successful. I actually tried going to college and it didn't work because actually college didn't have the structure that school did. So for a lot of autistic people, certainly for some, college can actually be more of a problem because there isn't that structure. And it wasn't until I actually started giving presentations about my autism, which again started off in a very small, very confined way. Um, it wasn't kind of going in front of a group of 200 people and giving a two hour presentation, it was very much a 10 minute. Um, a question and answer session where everything was rehearsed and kind of building up from there and gradually as I talked more and more about my own autism and as I talked more and more about the things that had been difficult to my life I gradually began to see that actually I was autistic and because going to these conferences meant that I heard other speakers other people who had their own interesting points of view on autism I was able to kind of make connections that I hadn't before and for the first time I was able to realize that yes I was autistic yes there were things I was always going to find difficult but there were positive aspects too I just think it's pretty amazing, obviously for him to go through so much, he had to go into care, you know, he was diagnosed at 16, that's a very late age compared to mine, like, it just, I mean, I know if I was in that situation, I'd be just be so scared, and for him to sort of overcome all that, and go through all those problems, and be talking to these people today, for me, I just think that's so amazing, because, you know, obviously these people in there, they may not have any clue what autism is and they can just all they have to do is just listen to him and listen to his experiences that he's been through over his life and they're going to understand it instantly and that just 
that's just really great for me. I think this journey that I've been on, uh, meeting all the people I've met, has been brilliant for me and proves my point that I that I stated at the very beginning of this was um, I want I want people to realise that it's not as bad as it seems and there's always a silver lining and for meeting Nick, John, I Spectrum, everyone, they've all just managed to take something that's negative into a positive and they're great role models and I really really hope that people are going to learn what I've learned by, by seeing this journey.